for Mad Max began in, uh, well, about 1997 for me, when uh, I, was, I was doing quite a bit of work for the film industry in those days and doing a lot of wireless camera type stuff, remote control and things like that. And uh, George Miller uh, came to us and saying that he'd like to be able to put together a bunch of different uh, operating units, the main unit, the second and effects units, which are basically small film units that actually operate in different locations doing things. When Max says film, it means video cameras. Yeah. Film is long gone. Well, they were filmed back when we, when we were talking about it. So it was video, video assist, so it was a, a literal a, a prism split off the camera itself, and that's how we used to send things around. Um, so Namibia was the next place to do it. So, you know, Mad Max had been filmed in Australia a couple of times with different, different uh, parts of it, and then they decided they wanted to go to Namibia. And so I went and did a survey and had a look at the various locations and came back and went, you know, oh my God, how are we going to do this? Um, microwaving across all the different spots. And then, um, unfortunately, 2001 came with 9-11. Uh, and then Hollywood basically said, nobody's travelling anywhere, we're not, the whole world's unsafe, nothing's happening. So the whole thing completely got shelved. And then after that, all that George wanted to do was to make his Mad Max. That's what, that's what he lived for, for Fury Road. So he eventually um, got, got the funding for it to go ahead. And it was all going to be filmed back in Australia, the safe part of the world, and we were going to do it out at Broken Hill. Did some of the initial film work out there. Uh, it, actually, this day, was, we were back to video now when we were doing this. Um, and, of course, we've had the most rain there's ever been, <laughs> and the whole place turned green. So for a post-apocalyptic movie, <laughs> little beautiful you know, desert flowers weren't going to really cut it. As far as the eye could see. Yeah, <laughs> so they basically decided at that stage that they would um, have to move it. So they came to me again and said, have you still got all your plans for Namibia? And I went, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And they go, well, it's on. And so that's kind of where we, where we got to and why we ended up in, in Africa. And the, and the brief there was to to deliver um, the video assist or the, the information for, for George Miller. So I think that's pretty much. There were eight, eight cameras simultaneously running the entire six months. And George had to see all the cameras at all the time. The original plan was of course to put it on a big truck yeah. and he would just sit there in his air conditioned truck and watch all the cameras coming in and the rest of it. Uh, the theory there was that it was gonna be a, uh, what we call a playground of about a kilometer square, maybe a little bit bigger. Well, the first time the, the cameras all took off on the on the trucks that were attached to, they went seven kilometres. So the audio department and us got together and went, this is not going to work. We can't be fixed, we have to be mobile. So within the space of, what, three weeks, all the Redesign. plans that had been gone for years got pulled apart, a whole lot of mobile trucks got put together and cobbled together and generators hanging off the back of four-wheel drives and the movie shows what we have to do. Yeah. Can somebody get the lights for us, please? Just... <laughs> while, while Russell's doing that, the, the original brief was to actually film this all in 3D. But in the time that it took for us to get to the stage where we were, now the technology had actually improved so much that they could do it with uh, single chip cameras and then create the 3D afterwards. Mm. The resolution's so high with the equipment that we had. The initial requirements for Mad Max Fury Road was for a single RF video unit with a playground on set of no more than a few kilometres, with the director based in the video assist truck. The original brief for RF requirements was to provide a camera monitoring feed for video assist on both moving and stationary shots. The initial idea was a stationary receive point, albeit vehicle mounted, that was tethered to the video assist truck. After the initial runs of the Mad Max Armada exceeded 7 kilometers, this rapidly morphed into moving video assist vehicles, complete with mobile director and RF receive points that followed the action. This meant that good quality reception had to be achieved at two locations, one following the action and the other a stationary position, to feed video assist for recording up to a few kilometers away. The RF trailer was purpose-built for Fury Road by Greg Roberts of Lateral Linking. The trailer was self-contained with a diesel generator, air compressor and dual air conditioners. It was also fitted with self-leveling hydraulic legs to ensure the mast was always perfectly vertical. The RF trailer had the capability of transmitting on two channels of DVB-T in full HD to provide dual local broadcast TV signals 
for on-set viewing, either while stationary or mobile. We call this Fury TV. Greg was tasked by director George Miller with having up to eight Arri Alexa cameras available live for video assist guru Zeb Simpson to record and replay. Zeb was able to show George cuts, loop playback, and show various live cameras, including the action unit, even when George was mobile via Fury TV. Another task for the RF crew was comms for the grips department. This took the form of shockproof pods containing radios and power supplies with interfaces for the Telex belt packs and headsets worn by the drivers and camera operators. The pods were mounted to the required vehicles and powered from one kilowatt petrol generators. Using basic news gathering and race cam style concepts was the starting point, with a centralized receiving point with the camera mounted transmitters. From this concept, the RF trailer, nicknamed Brian, came to be. Fitted with up to eight diversity receivers, fed from an L-band block down converters from an array of antennas atop a 15 meter pneumatic mast. The mast was fitted with an antenna rotator, similar to news cruiser style, and a directional horn antenna, along with a couple of omni antennas. Block down converters were fitted to each antenna at the masthead and fed to L-band splitters in the vehicle and distributed to the receivers. Modulation technique was OFDM, similar to DVB terrestrial transmissions in the 2.4 GHz band. When the second shooting unit evolved, the complexity increased as the sets had to be linked, with multiple video feeds and comms between them. Linking of the sites was done at packet level rather than baseband video, using carrier-grade 13 GHz data links, which allowed multiple repeater sites without multiple mod demod. The installation of fixed links in an OB environment on temporary scaffolds or on the back or top of vehicles presented security and mounting challenges that often changed multiple times in a day. The 2.4 GHz receive units were VisiLink 2174 with quad diversity inputs. These units had L-band block down converters which were powered up the coax feed that also ran the RF down to the truck. Each unit came equipped with a range of antennas from omni to quite directional. Having these remote receivers enabled setups that would not have been possible if baseband RF needed to be run. Satellite receivers could be deployed to areas where the trailer could not reach and cabled back to the truck via coax. We sometimes deployed same band repeaters using different antenna polarization and lateral placement to defeat receiver desensing. The camera transmitters were L1500 VisiLink units with 200 milliwatt output and a proprietary encoding algorithm that enabled full HD quality with only a one frame delay. The transmitters were quite small and lightweight, enabling attachment even to steady cam rigs without operator complaint. Two of the units were permanently mounted to the edge arm camera cars. The placement of the antennas at nearly five meters above the ground, combined with the 15 meter mast on the RF trailer enabled reliable reception at up to 10 kilometers in the flat Namib desert. But not all the filming locations were flat. Many key sequences were shot in deep ravines with steep sides. For these situations, the RF crew deployed up to five kilometers of fiber optic cable with receivers placed at strategic points along the run. Because of the nature of the film, with a large number of moving transmit sources, reception in hilly terrain was a major challenge. Multiple receive points with RF over fiber transmission helped. RF over fiber worked by centrally locating receivers and positioning block down converters with antennas roadside over distances up to a few kilometers, battery powered. The receivers, being diversity fed, could then actively select the best reception point along with some nimble patching as the action moved along, providing continuous solid feeds. Simultaneous to this was an ever-growing fleet of follow vehicles fitted with a number of monitors, receivers, radios, and personnel that chased the action. These all had a small one kilowatt AC generator mounted at the rear of the vehicle for power. As the chase vehicles evolved, this made life more difficult for radio comms, with camera operators requiring contact with the director and also with base camp. Vehicle rollovers, crashes, and minor incidents were the norm both planned and unplanned, so overnight repairs were common. 
The entire event required dynamic solutions, often with very limited time necessitating out-of-the-box thinking. Availability of hardware was a constant problem given the remoteness of the site and extended shipping delays. Camera video sources varied from current model ARRI cameras to high-end digital SLR cameras in disposable situations. In summary, it was a bit like the Bathurst 1000 meets the Paris-Dakar rally. Two shooting units with eight mobile and airborne cameras with video, audio and comms linked to a common site. Four follow vehicles with RF receive and record, set lengths up to five kilometers long. A broadcast HD TV station in the middle of the oldest desert in the world with dust everywhere and salt laden fog. All in all, it was a big challenge and great fun. So basically it's up to uh, lights off. We want to have a question from everybody if we can. Whatever you, uh, whatever you like to ask us. I think you got a pretty good overview of what, what happens. Is there anything you want to clarify? Yeah, you mentioned the antennas have to be really vertical. Is that describing what the ground's like or do they have to be really perfectly vertical? No, they have to be perfectly yeah. vertical. It's just because the ground could be uneven. Yeah, yeah just right. track leveling, okay. Well, we needed to get the, the mast the up. Mast, yeah. the, the main thing was to get the mast up because we needed that height to you know, give us obviously the distance. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was the main thing, was to, you know, because the mast wouldn't go up all that easily if it's on a slope, so. Yeah, oh, yeah, true. yeah. right, Dom. Okay. So it was all the recording done actually out with the chase vehicles and all that sort of thing, but the, the, the feed coming back is just so the director can work out exactly what he needs when. And yeah, all so it's, all, it's yeah. all monitoring, basically. Every, every single camera records it, because they're, they're recording at RAW, which was, God, and what speed is that? Furious data rates. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're at 2000. Nine. So I think I think it was the equivalent of eight K, was it? Which is four times. Was that right? Four oh, times. Uh, four times HD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, yeah. So they you know, no point trying to send that over a data link. It's just it's only for monitoring. So yeah, we were, yeah. everything was full HD that we were recording and, and retransmitting. Yeah. So we had eight, eight channels of receive that we could record well until they stripped the truck and put all in, in the follow vehicles, um, and we had two channels of conventional HD transmitter. So at one stage, George Miller was driving between the two filming units for about, what, 15k apart. Yeah. Oh, I know. If you're talking about the one where we both sat there yes. with each other, yeah. yeah. So um, they had the special effects unit, which was about nearly 60 kilometres away. 60, okay. By distance, so I think it was only about 20k's, but the way you had to go right around and come back in again, it just was, was mm. such a long distance. So um, what happens is, of course, they try and match shots because... If you're going to have an effect where there's an explosion or a truck blows apart, there's no point trying to film the bit before the truck blows apart because you don't know exactly how it's going to end up. So you get the truck to blow apart and then you can reproduce it somewhere else for the close-up stuff of people you know, laying on the ground or whatever it is. So the idea is that the, the shooting sequences were so tight that they would um, do the special effect. It would be beamed over. George would actually look at it live and then they could actually rebuild what they were doing for all the close-up work um, you know, on the other location. Right. So George is in his truck out in the middle of nowhere, about, you know, 15 odd k's out. He's stopped in the middle of the thing and he's saying to us via the 2A radio, which is coming back to our tower, which is then going down, it's being converted into IP, it's being then sent from IP across over the digital link to the other side, where it's breaking back out again into a 2A radio repeater system. So the director over there is talking to George, going backwards and forwards over here, they're transmitting high-speed, um, what they call plate shots, which are basically just you know, trapped camera background shots. They're sending those over. Yeah. The guy on his Macintosh is actually also using the IP link to actually pull files back so they can do it. And George is actually getting a cut made. Like he's actually getting a little sequence edited together to make sure it's going to work. And in Jack and middle, I, it's in the middle of the desert, yeah. watching all this stuff happening, and we're beaming out these two channels of HD, and the guy in the truck is feeding all this stuff and doing this stuff. We just sat back in the middle of the truck and looked at the pictures and went, fuck it, worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's really it's was easy. just, because you where he was, he, could, he couldn't use his normal radios because he was on the OFB circuits, but he was in yeah. a range. So we had to shut down most of the two-way traffic on this particular channel because the director wanted it. That's what, mm -hmm. what happens. Yeah. It was most of it like the linking gig? Yeah. 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 But these, oh, no. uh, these 13 gig links really saved us because we had the, those comms going back and forth, bi-directional video, files, the lot. 
Uh, so some, 600 we, megabit per second. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that was the next and we just saw those links set up. Um, we couldn't drive to those locations. We had to carry all the equipment to the top of those hills <laughs> with the scaffolding, with the generators, and every four hours go back and fill up the petrol tanks because otherwise it would go dry. And the one where the uh, links were set up on the sand dune on the quad bike, all was fine for about, what, 40 minutes. And then all of a sudden, the link started to wave and the signal's going screaming up the top of the hill. The wind has undercut the rear wheels of the, of the quad bike and the whole quad bike's doing this <laughs> on two wheels. And the yeah. link's just going... Mm. Yeah. yeah. And that was, that was a sort of fun again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was, that was the end of that. Um, when, when you're trying to get your know, RF channels and that and you're in a foreign country, do you have to get license or do you just oh, yeah. go for it? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> you don't go unless you want to go to jail. <laughs> but um, look, over there, um, one of, the, one of the, the big advantages with this film was because I was involved early enough, I was actually able to set up a lot of sort of an RF policing process, if you like, because if you looked at the amount of spectrum that was used by everybody, um, we went from 27 meg all the way up to 13 gigahertz, and it was stuck pretty well across the whole lot of that thing with, you know, people remote driving vehicles to explosions to things to, you know, drones to... You Even know, remote, remote focus for the cameras, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, if the guy's on a steady cam, which is completely yeah. wireless, wireless camera, there's his first assistant camera guy, he's responsible for the focus, little knob, little antenna, somewhere in the 2.4 gig band. So, yeah. So, so we, we, we basically had the, the I guess, the... We were lucky in that everything had to be approved by me for, for use right. so that there was no interference because I didn't yeah. want anything holding the film up. Um, anecdotally, I went over there for the first survey and I took my spectrum analyzer and we went right to the, one of the further most points, almost up to the Angolan border. And I got my spectrum analyzer out and turned it on and we just sort of like, <laughs> like, is it working? Because <laughs> 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 so I turned every time we turned their mobile phones off. Yeah, you know, so I made sure I wasn't getting any, anything serious on there. And can, can you turn your mobile phone back on again? <laughs> make sure. Oh, yeah, that's working. There's nothing there. So there's absolutely there's nothing. nothing. There. I mean, obviously, when you got close to the cities and things like that, there were, yeah. were stuff there. But we you know we built a spectrum plan and worked with the Namibian authorities over there in terms of what we wanted, because we were transmitting to um, DVB-T television channels at uh, about 50 watts. So <clears throat> you know they do require they they do want you to kind of not. So not. was that broadband? I mean, was, so was that encrypted traffic? Or? No, well, we didn't. It's funny you mentioned that because there was great discussion about should we encrypt this in case someone sees the pictures. Yeah. So if they want to import a TV from Australia, then they can watch okay. the signal. Yeah. Nah. But apart from that, no, no one else. Yeah, we were out. We were out. Right. Fortunately, we were still within the broadcast band, but we we're outside the Namibian, right. Namibian okay. stuff. So they gave us, you know, special permission yeah. to do that, which you know didn't, didn't affect them in the size. So you talked about didn't. changing polarization to stop interference between. Well, a couple of times we had to to try to get signals out of places we couldn't get the truck to, and the remote receivers are out of, out of out of range. Okay. So we just tried the old trick of changing the polarisation on the transmit and receives, right. and then go out the back end on the pretty much the same band, mm -hmm. but going vertical instead, right. and a bit of horizontal separation. We got away with it. Okay. And, and, and the reason, I mean, it. normally you wouldn't do that, but the reason we had to do that was because we had so many receivers out that would be receiving the same camera, for example. Mm -hmm. So if you try and repeat it in that circumstance, rather than actually having to go, and, and these, all these vehicles aren't alongside each other, they're all over the place, you know, that's the, that's the, the camera operator who's remotely controlling, you know, you saw one of those, um, like the June buggy top things with the camera hanging out the front of it. Yeah. Well, the, the person who's actually operating that isn't anywhere near that. He's actually about a kilometre or maybe two kilometres behind that vehicle somewhere else. And these things are doing like 80 k's to 100 k's. They're not, not messing around, like they're going for it. It's just too dangerous to have the the operators inside. I mean, you just wouldn't be able to control room. the camera. Oh, and yeah, of course. It's two, two, two person vehicle. I'm sure they couldn't build them to take as many pills as yeah. they still would have done 100 kilometres an hour. But the thing is, it was just too dangerous and they couldn't operate them properly. So those people away. So we had receivers all over the place. Now, if that vehicle was in a situation where it might be coming up through a gully, um, yeah, then we had to get that signal back to these operators somehow and to George and to the you know, people recording it and to you know, make up people and everybody else that wanted to see this stuff. Um, so that's where we were kind of forced to get the original single and then repeat it, you know, on the same same frequency by, you know, doing whatever we could, you know, back-to-back -back antennas or... It would have been great if we could have just used the HD transmitters for that, but the lag, the encode and decode lag was too great because these guys in the, in the follow vehicles 
a remote control on a camera yeah. and he's got the wheels and he's actually looking at the camera, pan left, pan right, tilt up, tilt down. If he's two seconds in yeah. lag, it's useless. Yeah. They actually complained about two frames. You know, yeah. uh, that's, that's where the technology is. They complained about two frames. Yeah. So. So Explain to them the velocity of light. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's still an encode and decode yeah. thing that's yeah. got to go somewhere. Mm. But the HD stuff was too slow, whereas the links we were using, were they 40 grand or 40,000 US per channel, I think they were. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. And that's yeah. what you get, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Um, you know, very low lag. Which so is they killed any cinema then? They, yeah. they, they did do a, a bit of damage to a lot of stuff, yeah. I mean, there was there's disposable cameras. I was using the Canon... Um, 5Ds. 5Ds. Yeah. 35 of them went, none of them came oh, back. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. they got the card out of it, that's all they yeah. cared about. <laughs> they were the disposable cameras. Obviously, you know, there was a lot of other other stuff there. Yeah, the camera I'm not concerned about. I was concerned, more concerned about the glass they stuck on the front of it. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I mean, the, um, the, the, the proper uh, Cineflex lenses and stuff that they were using, I mean, those things were obviously worth a lot of money and, you know, they, they yeah. got a fair bit of care on So the camera might be three grand, but the lens is 30 grand. Well, no, oh, the, the, the Canon's just used ordinary glass. Oh, you're talking about just the Canon yeah. camera. Sorry, I'll be um, talking about the... The, yeah. uh, the Canon's just used ordinary glass and yeah. none of that survived. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So they won't use things like Zeiss, Cinema... No, that was, on the, that was on the big cameras right. and on those they were very careful. Okay. But the thing is, too, you're talking about fine powdered sand, and I mean, we were in many, many sand dunes, oh, yeah, sure. so, um, sand storms. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, literally where it would just, you know, it would hurt to be outside. Um, you know how we ended up with not things being sandblasted. Well, one, of, one of our crew actually got lost in the sandstorm. We could hear her on the radio. She's trying to drive to a certain spot, and we could hear the sand hitting the windscreen mm -hmm. over the two way. We said, just stop. What do we? Don't, oh, but we're, we're in a hurry. Don't care. Just stop your vehicle because you can't see where you're going. And this stuff was blinding. Yeah, and apparently it takes the paint off the cars too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, some of the links you saw set up there on those scaffolds, it was one shot with a link sitting on the back of a, a ute. Not scaffold, it was sort of like this. That was actually live. We had no time, there was no scaffold. It was just get it operational, we'll go with what we got. So I was just sitting here and go, yep, we're good, walk away. How long were you both away for? I was away seven months. Well, in I was in the movie for six. Yeah, so I went to South Africa after that for a bit of. Uh, no, no, no. I was actually still working on the on the film. Really, with the they did uh, further further work down in South Africa. So, so was that all for video, but also audio? Did you have the audio as well? Oh yeah, the audio was married in to, to it, but there was a whole separate truck which was doing nothing but all the audio. Okay. Now I can still see. Yeah, it's good stuff. More questions. Yeah. Um, obviously, you had a lot of recabling and fixing and changing out on site. Did you do it? Did you have RF techs with you? Did you have a, a bench space set up somewhere? Look, you're looking at the RF. Yeah, looking at the RF. <laughs> 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 the back of the car. <laughs> you got, you got, in here, you've got the entire the entire department from management down to the <laughs> down to swoop, down to swooping at the truck. It's amazing, yeah. you guys are still talking. You're looking at looking at it. Yeah. Oh, no, we had a team of uh, six, six mostly, sometimes four. Yeah. Um, but yeah, even that wasn't enough sometimes. Yeah. Um, the only time we actually didn't quite make our specifications was we'd, we'd rolled out about three or four k of fiber optic cable okay. down one of the valleys with all the receivers on it, cable back to the truck. All the used to use of the Golf. That is yeah, exactly right. the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. of the Golf. And that in actual took, fact, if you looked at it, it was identical. And that took about yeah. a day to get all that in and test it. And we're having a cup of tea in the afternoon, and someone says, oh, have you heard about the change? <laughs> uh, what change? Well, instead of that part of the valley, we're in that part of the valley. Oh, it was like, oh. Oh. <laughs> There was no way in the world we'd get it done in time, because it was what, half an hour before dark. Yeah. And the stuff we were climbing up was dangerous in the daylight, yeah, yeah. let alone the dark. So we, we got uh, one of the trucks, the little trucks, shoved it at the end of the run, got the cars out of one of the, the, the tracking trucks, shoved it in our transmitter, beamed it back. We are about 15 minutes behind live time. So there was lots of that making up stuff to do. Mm. I mean, you talk about in the film about you know, it's impossible to get stuff delivered and all that sort of thing. Did you have enough kit, or were you having to get stuff? No, no, we have we 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 had enough spares because right. we we basically you know like I I'd, I'd been there a couple of times so oh, yeah. I knew what we were looking at, um, and 
you know, we, we had enough spares to get us through the primary level and sort of damage, if you like. Yep. But even then, we still didn't have enough stuff. We had to get, you know, spares flown in and, you know, it would take about a month to get stuff turned around. So, you know, we were, at times we were struggling for, you know, power amps. BNC and, connectors. <laughs> you know, and just, you know, just general stuff. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, RS um, was in, was in Cape Town, so we were able to get some stuff up from there. But even though we're getting it from England to there or whatever, you know, mm. so. But it's a thousand k from Cape Town. Yeah. yeah. So, <coughs> you know, yeah. What's the job like that, boy? To who? To me? To, yeah. How much money does it cost to do all that? Well, I think, uh, well, I think it was, uh, it was... To put you in the picture, the fuel bill for the film alone, yeah. for all the support that he was on the vehicles in the film, was two and a half million dollars US. Oh, oh, just fuel. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. fuel. Mm. I can't. Uh, I forget what the I forget what the daily the daily budget was. It was something like two and a half million a day or something like that yeah. was. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure what that actually includes because it probably doesn't include the actors, for example. Mm -hmm. It's probably just the running costs. I mean, well, those that vehicle you saw with the long crane arm with mm -hmm. the camera on the end of it, most remarkable vehicle. That thing could charge across the desert at 150 k and then give you a rock solid picture of behind a motorbike and then pull back and go round it. These guys were phenomenal. <laughs> and about a third of the way in the film, George Miller said to them, and these guys are Americans and go, you know, very loud, and I want another one. <laughs> <laughs> and they went, what? <laughs> There's 12 on the planet, don't care what another one. <laughs> and they pulled one off a film in the States, pulled it apart, put it in a plane and flew to Africa. <laughs> and that shot you saw there with the two of them and the director and the production assistant is the only time you've ever seen two on the planet ever. Because I said to these guys, how many times have you had what, two of these on the film? And they were like 25 grand US a day or yeah, something. Yeah, 40 grand a fair. Yeah, so, but they, yeah. they shot probably 70% of the film. Yeah. And if you have seen the film, 90 plus percent of what you saw actually happened. Yeah. It's not computer explosions. All those things actually right. happened. Yeah. There's certainly, there's certainly there's enhanced. Enhanced. There's a lot of enhancement on there, but yeah. everywhere there was a bit of flame, there was a bit of flame for real, and they've just you know yeah. developed yeah. it on from there. When the, the, in that tanker explosion, we yeah. went to great pains with very special tape and mylar and all sorts of stuff on the cameras, the transmitters, even the BNC cables had to be wrapped because those little trucks you saw actually went through the fireball with operators in them. <laughs> with the cameras and all. <laughs> and the transmitters a lot. Hold your breath, here we go. Pretty much. <laughs> and on the that was the last day of the shoot. Uh, were, you, were you there for the last day? Have you got to Cape Town already? No, I got to Cape Town there. No, um, oh, no, no, I was there. No, I was there because we had the pack. They were supposed to do the big explosion on the yeah. tanker. Mm -hmm. And the day kept dragging on and on and on and on and on. It was a remote control vehicle, the full size, but a little remote control. And about three o'clock, someone goes, We can't fix it. The remote steering had broken. Oh. Now, by this stage, all the little tent cities that these film crews had had gone, was on the way to Cape Town. Catering had gone. Admin gone, everything's on the way to Cape Town. They went, get them all back. We're doing it tomorrow. Back it all came for one day and one yeah. shot. It's stuck to film if you can get it right, I mean. It was the big bang. It was the big bang. And we're sitting in the truck watching the big bang, and with that many cameras, every, at one stage, every camera managed to get every other camera in shot. <laughs> yeah. Which takes some doing, but they need to do it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, that was, uh, it didn't work the first time. And literally, there were trucks on the way to South Africa. Get them back. It's nice to have the power, isn't it? Well, there's no it's, choice. It's a whole, it's a whole different world. Really. It's, no I mean, choice. It's, it's just, you know, <laughs> the infrastructure's just massive. You know, what you, there's, you know, to, I don't think we ever got a shot. I should have taken a photograph of like all the trucks all lined up with all their back doors open and everybody, all their own, everybody's departments oh. all got trucks, you know, all in there. It's just, it's massive amount of the equipment that's in there. I mean, just the, just the air compressor for the grips guys yep. alone. I mean, that would have been like half the size of this room, you know, to the, the tank, you know. So, so the Yanks are funding this film as a, as a result of George Miller. Sorry? So the Yanks are funding all of this? As a oh, result yeah. of George Miller yeah. suing them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, actually, okay. came, actually came, the actually execs came from one of us, came down at one stage. So when you see a bunch of guys in the desert all wearing shorts and caps and sunglasses, and there's two blokes in dark suits, <laughs> off you go, you know, they were like... Yeah, it was interesting. It was very, very interesting. How many people were on the set there? 
I think cast and oh, okay. crew around about 1500. Oh, <laughs> was a that's small, across, that's a small across, city. Yeah, yeah. It was basically effectively, it, it broke up to at one stage up to three different units that were shooting simultaneously. Primarily it was the main unit to start with and then it broke into the, the action unit, which um, which I was talking about before. And then there was sort of smaller break off units doing different bits and pieces. But yeah, it was a lot of people. I mean, the catering tent alone, I've got some photographs oh. of the, you know, the catering that you have, you know, and you can tell how good, I mean, they, you know, an army marches on a stomach and they certainly, uh, certainly did that well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they had a, a massive city of those uh, fifth wheel caravan, you know, the trailers, and, mm -hmm. and there would have been gee, at least 40 of those, all, you know, like double expando things. And, mm -hmm. and there was a team of just people who just continually cleaned. These were out of England. Did you hear when I got hooked? I was in one of the. I'll tell this story, you may not have heard this. No. Um, action unit was getting in shot of the main unit. So Mel says, get them out of there, move everything out of the shot, I want that angle. And I'd wandered over there to go to the loo, one of the reporter loos that they put wheels on it. Next thing, it's being hooked up. I'm inside it. It's like a Mr. Burns. The guy went, hurry up, I'm trying. <laughs> True story. Yeah. No, I didn't hear about that. <laughs> Yeah, so no, guess, it's yeah, massive toilet blocks and stuff, yeah. Have you guys ever been involved in anything that grand in the past or do you think they'll do it again? Just no, not, not to that size. Uh, I mean, I've worked on pretty well every major motion picture that's come to Australia. So, you know, all of the Matrix series, you know, Superman, The Thin Red Line, um, you know, just about everything. But this was something else. This something, yeah, this was a whole other layer, again, of what was... How long ago was that? Which one? This one, 2012? Uh, two, two, yeah, 2012. Oh, okay, long before it was even. Yeah, yeah. Well, halfway through it, I had to go to England for the for the little sports carnival over there. <laughs> so I had to called the Olympics, but I had to uh, <laughs> had to go to that and then come back. So I was away for a month yeah. in the middle of it. Are you doing the sailing again? Or yeah, I'm there for four months this time, so okay. maybe even longer. Well, that'll be the next lecture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can do one on that, sure. So, yeah, so it's something, who hasn't asked a question? Come on, there must be some other stuff. Anybody want to know about the, the filming side of it? The, you know, what is, I mean, I played golf with Charlize Theron twice. <laughs> I, got drunk, I got drunk with Charlize Theron once. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. who won the golf? Uh, <laughs> She's not all that good a player, to be <laughs> terrific. But she's a good drinker. But she's a good drinker. Actually, quite fun. I was, I, um, Played, but her mother was over there uh, chaperoning their their child and um, Charlie's child. Um, and Goethe Theron, um, said to me, uh, "Do you feel like a beer?" And I went, "Yeah, well, you're yeah, sure we'll have to wait for the, you know whatever it is. This is playing in in, uh, in Namibia." And um, she said, "Oh well, Charlie's has got him in a golf bag, right?" <laughs> so we went over. Charlie's give us a beer. What are you talking about? So Charlie's has been carting this golf cart with all these beers in there. That <laughs> Goethe had stuffed in there with ice, you know. And, uh, yeah, yeah, he's going, yeah, Charlie, you're getting too fat anyway. You need to be, you need to be doing more that, exercise. So that pull was up, our pull one, one day off a week, six day weeks for yeah. six months. Yeah, six days a week. Did you hang around there or until fast? Like, go uh, there or? was a bit of time to get around, but you know, you get to be back in twenty four hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. I went off with the um, the audio guys um, up to a place called White Lady Lodge, which again is up on the Angolan border, and we big you know big reserve up there. We're camping in the sort of the riverbed, if you like, and sort of midnight you could hear this noise, and you could see in the moonlight the whole like tribe of, of elephants moving through, you know. Mm. And I think that was the one time we had like three days off in a row, or whatever it was. Or oh, something that was weird. when they stopped production for. A yeah, right, it was yeah. a weird. So anyway, we're up there, and and the South African guys had convinced me that drinking Jagermeisters and beer is a, is a good thing. I apparently got to do it. Okay. Um, the next morning, we were there for two nights. The second morning, we came down. The the park ranger came in in his uh, Land Rover, drove up, and said, oh, "I camped up. I was camped up from you guys last night down when He said there's no chance there was going to be animals attacking you." Guys, last night at all. Because <laughs> yeah, he said, I could hear you from where I was. He said, 
whatever animals there were around, the yeah, three guys, small. they would have gone, we don't know what that is, but we're not going near it. <laughs> <laughs> Australians. Tell yeah. the full story. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, no, it was the snoring. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned before about having to like shut down a couple of video feeds to get traffic across the link. How did you manage the you know the bandwidth to different parts of the system? Because we got a lot of traffic flying well, we around. Really, not, not on the not on the actual IP link. That, no, was, that was. I mean, we did do some dynamic management of that. Mm. There was there's different tunnels in that in we set it up. Mm. Um, you had to be because we. Because the second unit was, or the action unit was actually feeding two video streams back to us, mm. um, which were then going through a, a vision router, or a video and audio router, and then being transmitted again. So we had mm. two coming in, and then we were feeding some feeds, some signals back to them as well, as well as it was a data stream for the guys to swap their, their files back between mm. each other. Because mm. uh, Seb Simpson is, is, is sort of manufacturing the movie on the fly. So mm. he's... He's pretty well got the movie, but there's just all these holes in it everywhere. Yeah. So as you as you shoot it, he's dropping stuff into it. So at any time, George can say, you know, show me, that. Show me the movie, you know, yeah. and he can look at it, and there'll be, um, you know, different different stuff in the spot. So yeah. they're swapping all these files backwards mm. and forwards all the time. So um, I think there's only a couple of times when we might have got pretty close to being a capacity, mm. but you know, the, the thing just shuttles in like it it chokes itself. You know, yeah, well, you've got yeah. Yeah. quality yeah, right. service quality. running, so it keeps yeah, the video stream going. I think yeah. there was one time we, had, we actually did have mm. to shut a camera down from action unit because there was a bloody big file that said what it was saying. Yeah, right. Yeah. One time only. Yeah. And it had to be there quick or something. But there was a lot of stuff going backwards and forwards over there because mm. we were also feeding um, the repeater, RF repeater control. Because what happened was the, all the radio repeater gear was actually supplied by a South African company. It was originally going to come with us. Mm. We were going to supply everything. But the budget that we put in was like over a million just for the, just to do the radio side of it. Mm. And, and that was going to be you know, backbone off the Namibian main of the, they've got radio repeater house. And we were going to effectively cover about 800 kilometres of stuff with, with radio repeaters and, and do it all that way. Mm. So in the end, it was sort of a bit of a mismatch where they had the repeater system that they were doing, which were kind of, they, they, had, they had a lot of trouble with it, it wasn't working that well. So we ended up ended up sort of joining our stuff together. It was a quasi repeater, if you like, whereas mm. we have the transmitters at either end, uh, and then we join them together with the IP link. Yep. Um, so we were, there was a lot of stuff going backwards and forwards mm. over the link, so it became Sounds pretty like critical. It. Yeah. To you know what was going on. I mean, the executive producer, as I was saying goodbye to him, he. He just said, look, you know, what what you guys have achieved here is pretty amazing. He said he's mm -hmm. never seen it anywhere else in the world. Yeah. Uh, and he said that, that the amount of time and, and therefore money that was saved because of the infrastructure that we were able to put on it was, was incredible. Like they yeah. saved a lot of money being able, to, yeah. being able to do it that way. Mm. Yeah. Well, will, they do, will they do it again that size? I don't know. I think the budget for the whole film was 200 million plus. <laughs> oh, no, it was way more, way more than that, I think. What is it? Oh yeah, I thought it was getting up. Oh, look, I don't know what it was, but I thought it was yeah. significantly more than that. Yeah. Well, two and a half. Yeah. Two and a half million a day, was it? American. Yeah. You say? Yeah. Twelve yeah. or seven months. Yeah. Well, and that's all production. I think there was. I think we're talking closer to. Okay. I think we're talking like dollars, more billions. Than, more yeah. than a lot of them. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so the answer is probably not. Yeah. <laughs> and it made a profit. It did. Yeah, it's done, done very well. It's done a lot, a lot of money for him and, and mm. George's. And I don't know what money you put on six Oscars, but George can write his own ticket next time. Yeah. Mm. And he's been wanting to do it for a long time. He, you know, it's, been, he, it's the one thing he wanted to do. And they, they forced him to do Happy Feet 2, which he just didn't have his heart in. Because, you know, Happy, Happy Feet 1 was such a success mm. and they wanted him to do it. And they said that yeah. they kept dangling the carrot going, we're, we're not going to let you do Mad Max till you get Happy Feet 2 out. And of course, you know, it wasn't going to go that well. And, and so you just wanted to move on. So, but am I wrong in saying that if, if Max had gone ahead and went with the original schedule pre two thousand, the kit we had didn't exist. No, it didn't. No, mm. so it would have been lucky it got delayed. It would have all been done with. I mean, well, back in there, it would just would have been like literally a vision, vision out off a film camera. Yeah, and it would have and been you know, color, you know, color, and then we would have fed it just by standard microwave links. Mm. Between. Okay. Taken three times as long to cap per film. Well, the other thing too is that you know back then there wasn't really the pressure on it that there is now. There are so many films come out that they've got to really turn it around quite quickly. 
you know, even though it did take a long time for it to come two out. Two years to cut. You yeah. know, two years to cut is still quite fast for something. And considering that the, you know, when we started to do it, it was going to be literally stereo, you know, like uh, 3D stereo cameras, you know, with all, all the stuff that goes with, with us with dual, you know, dual transmitters. And, mm -hmm. and then by the time we'd actually come around to doing it, mm -hmm. Um, they, they went into a hiatus for a little bit and then they came out again and they said, well, look, you've got another chance here if you want to change your, what technology you're using. And we go, well, it's the brief change. And they go, well, yeah, we're going to, we're going to use these Alexa cameras. So the resolution is so high on those that they can literally pan the vision within the, the image of the guy and they can create 3D out of it. So, you know. And considering that the old, in the old days, what it used to shoot the film, send it off to the lab, so they do a print of it, and it come back, and they'd watch what's called the rushes. Mm -hmm. It's a 24-hour cycle. Well, George is watching it live. So that's where it's got to, mm. the pressure of time. Yeah. Mm. Well, I hope you found that entertaining. Yeah. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. All right. Very good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.